So um, this is um, the head of math department of Sala. He's going to welcome you. So big, great welcome to all of you. Great to see so many PhD students to take the same in your classes. Doesn't matter. <laughs> so welcome to Uppsala and to the Olmsted Laboratory. Uh, so I'm in the math department. So we're part of this. Uh, yeah, most probably in different ways. And what grass is from the math department in the second teacher's course. Very, very good. Uh, so we're on the top floor. Basically, not above this corridor, but above the main corridor. That's where we are. There's also the grand new nice building on the front that was completed uh, this spring, where the IT department is. And uh, yeah, be sure to check out the newest building at some point. It's, it's pretty nice. nice they had lunch there. Well, oh, great, great. Yes. So yeah, good to see you all, and I hope we'll have a nice course here. It sounds like an exciting topic. I'm going to go talk out now. Welcome, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, welcome to Scalable Data Science and Distributed Machine Learning. Um, I am Roz, been bombarded by <laughs> announcements and discussions from me. <laughs> I should say uh, uh, slightly apologetically that I was told that the course starts and the semester starts and it should be a classroom for the most part. So I think uh, I think now everyone is feeling okay. So what is this course? Basically, it's about large clusters composed of a network of commodity computers with new hardware, including GPUs, GPUs, CPUs, and SSDs, uh, that's memory disks. And these are essentially the workhorses for solving today's problems in the industry, right? So, um, so those who have data and resources uh, have quite a lot of say in taking actions in the world, right? So part of this, we will formally see it as decision theory, although this course is not about decision theory, but the main emphasis of the course is to give you an idea of um, what it means to analyze uh, deterministic and randomized algorithms in um, the standard von Neumann architecture, which is uh, a memory I device and a processor, and generalizing that to parallel algorithms where you have uh, many abstract machine models, as you saw in the notes, and uh, equivalence class of these abstract machine models can actually be studied as the so-called work depth model, right? That's the main thing you need to take away from the first couple of lectures of Reza's course at Stanford, so this is sort of running jointly. And uh, finally, uh, a lot of the applied parts we will be doing here in face-to-face -face discussions is on taking these uh, Sort of parallel random access machines in their uh, work depth uh, abstraction, and then take, turning them over into a distributed collection of work depth models, where you also have to worry about communication complexity between each of these uh, work depth parallel random access machines. Am I making sense? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So that's the algorithms point, right? So there, I think because of the mixed background, you've already taken quizzes. It's just to keep you a little bit with the material. You can get as much or as little uh, as you want uh, from the actual uh, lecture notes there. But it's mainly there because last two years ago when we did the course, there were some mathy students who would have really liked to go a lot deeper into, into theorems and uh, randomized algorithms and so on. So if you want to do a group project that's slightly theoretical, then uh, that's sort of helping you take the first steps in that direction. Having said that, most group projects should really be ideally practical. So we will come to that. So we want you to analyze some data using these algorithms. In a shard, we will provide from a courtesy of Databricks, uh, which is the commercial arm of this Apache Spark ecosystem um, that we will be mostly uh, delving ourselves into. Okay, so module one is introduction to data science and analysis of parallel algorithms. And module two will be introduction to distributed algorithms for data science and machine learning. So we will just sort of, uh, basically tomorrow is when we will really get our hands dirty. Um, we will learn uh, Apache Spark core, okay? And uh, there are many choices to make here, but we are, learning the language that the Apache Spark core the, is written in, which is Scala. So a lot of you will be like, oh, I don't want Scala, <laughs> take it easy. You will always have to learn a new language in the next five years if you get into industry. 
So it should be no biggie, right? I'm not like a Scala expert. I'm not contributing to Scala source, but we will actually be users of Scala just enough. The main reason is because we want to be able to interface with libraries that are in the most active fronts of development, which are purely in Scala within the ecosystem. Having I mean, said that, I know most of you have some idea about Python. So we're not like anti-Python or anything. We will dive into Python in time, right? But Python will be done by a PySpark within the Python Spark ecosystem so that various, uh, you know, basically C and C++ code that are Python wrapped from Google and Facebook and so on, we can actually tap into them like TensorFlow and things like that, but confined within distributability, right? That's why Scala part is nice because a lot of the ETL, extract, transform, load, data cleaning operations are more or less optimally done in the native language of the system. Okay. Uh, yeah. So tomorrow is mainly Scala introduction, uh, Spark core, and um, getting our hands a bit dirty with SQL. And then the module two, I will cover uh, the machine learning library and uh, distributed vertex programming framework within this paradigm called GraphX. And uh, a few other things like how to use ML pipelines uh, in these nice abstractions in the Apache Spark ecosystem. Module three is diving deeper. So this is you dive at your own, like whatever, love of work, whatever you're interested in. So I'm going to give you a whole set of uh, topics you can dig into. So this is basically, um, <laughs> So let's see, github.io. So I kind of, it's not quite ready. I'm just sort of uh, kind of making it as we go. So this is the course pathways. So your pathway for 2022 is doing this first. Um, so you can just download the DBC file and upload it into your Databricks Community Edition. Hopefully all of you have Databricks Community Edition now, right? So you basically download this, uh, yes. So it should just come down uh, and then uh, you can also just um, yeah, copy the URL and paste it directly into your community edition by the loading from a link if you want to avoid UU wireless going crazy, okay? And the same with this one. And so these are the two modules for tomorrow. After that, so second module, we will go here. And then the rest are all uh, different things. So this is, uh, can't forget about this. This is two, two years ago. I think your uh, predecessors uh, had a lot more in the last time. So this one is uh, Spark streaming. If you're interested in say live experiments in Twitter and so on, this is structured streaming, um, geospatial computing, uh, deep learning. So this should be a recall for most of you. This is single machine deep learning with uh, Keras, uh, uh, TensorFlow. I am not interested in um, testing your syntax too much, okay, a little bit, but not too much. So here, uh, if you kind of jog your memory and all kinds of basic deep learning on a single machine, then uh, you will actually be able to follow this because this is this course is not about single machine deep learning, right? So it's about DDL, distributed deep learning, but this is a prerequisite for it. Distributed deep learning, you have other frameworks. Uh, mostly here we use more about runner, uh, depending on how people get sight. There are others one could get into um, if there's time. And here's another nice uh, use case, uh, you know, some financial transactions and um, some sort of real, real, um, real time data on news events. And so this is just inspire you to uh, get interesting data sets. So for example, here we analyze uh, all of the world's news every 15 minutes called the GDEL project. And um, um, so for example, these are in um, uh, completely open source uh, backend, so called data lakes, where you have, you know, Every 15 minutes, uh, world's news summarized in English and then translated from all the major languages into English. And there's metadata on it with URLs to the actual news article. 
So this is originally a CAA project. But anyway, these kinds of resources are already available. So you don't have to do ETL, but you could actually start doing some kind of interesting analytics project if you, if you want to do that. So what did your uh, predecessors do? So this is actually, this is all like, uh, so the idea is that we will be writing a book sort of live. Oh, maybe I should turn on these lights. Um, so, something better. So this is basically various group projects the students did uh, two years ago. And um, there is uh, essentially people studied the flashback machine. Uh, they did some latent directly allocation after doing raw processing of the, of the data from flashback using their own Scala parsers and so on. So these are heavy projects, right? The idea is so that you get to work with those who skills are complementary to your own. And no group projects can be single person. Okay, that's the main rule. Ideally, three to four would be very good, right? So uh, there is, yeah, so they did some loading data, logistic regression, work with that, click and their application. So mix of people in mathematics and natural language processing and so on. Um, I don't want to go too much into it. Some, some, some projects actually became publications, two of them actually. Uh, and one of them actually uh, was a voluntary student project. This was uh, someone that uh, sort of learned it. All the material was open and these were doing X jobs with me. And they actually put a model, improved a model that was in production in al deep inside Kiruna, sort of one of Sweden's main heavy industries, right? They produce iron ore pellets and there's a problem there. So we will have them speak about it on the, on the first day of the second module. Right? Okay, that's enough. Uh, so this is reserved for you. Obviously, it's for euphoria right now, but uh, you get the idea. Okay. So today, what am I mainly going to do? Right. So this is the, um, oh, by the way, one more point. So there is this chart called Uppsala Uni Skaramali DS Projects That is the resource we will be using. Okay, and um, so all these modules I mentioned to you will already be available when you are invited to the chart on day two of the module two. Until then, you're learning in community edition. Okay. When we come here, what happens is uh, the projects will actually be organized because this is basically unlimited backend, right? We have about uh, 3,000 US dollars from AWS that's sponsoring the course. And Databricks has waived all its, uh, whatever, engineering magic fees. So it's, uh, you know, so that four, four students can get together. So if I look at the archives and show you what happened uh, two years ago, this is basically how everything will be set up. There will be student project 01, 02, 03 group, and then the name of the group. And then in each of these projects, the group members will have uh, currently have removed permissions, but basically it's, uh, it's all permission controlled nicely. Okay, so, so all the group members will have rights to edit and modify all the files. You work together, then will be a designated group project leader who will be given control over uploading libraries and and you know, checking with me or uh, and they need extra resources and so on, because everything is live. Okay. AWS bill is on my personal credit card, right? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. Yeah. So anyway, so it's cool. It's it's meant to simulate sort of a real world situation, and I'll try and monitor and so on. But one of you will have the responsibilities, and you can do things in a more like a, how things are done among data scientists and ML engineers in several um companies, including in Sweden. Okay. Um, all right, let's jump into contents now. So I'm mainly prepping for uh, the, the talk by um, our guest speakers. So um, from Stockholm Environment Institute. Yeah. And, uh, is it a startup? Trace.earth. Oh, okay. 
So they are here and then several others are invited to motivate you to pursue projects that are sort of more uh, real worldish. Okay, so this is the, the first notebook. So if you upload the, uh, if you sort of upload it into your community edition, so I'm opening community edition on the side here. So you create a folder called Scalable Data Science. And in here, basically, if you just uh, import and then browse the file that, that .dbc file that got downloaded, right? It was uploaded, I've just done that. So you will see this if you want. Uh, for this lecture, it doesn't matter, but for later, we want to do this live. So all of you are coding at the same time as me and so on, because there is a lot of few tries and so on. Okay, but I just want to point out that this interface is slightly older. So I will mostly be uh, on, on this interface. So, um, uh, so we can go to recents. Um, so I'll go here. Um, so this interface is slightly different, okay? And the community edition will eventually evolve to this. So, but it's basically the same. So here are some expected reference readings. So if you want to really get into what's going on with Spark, this is not something I can transmit in a few hours. It's a really wide world. But these are the, uh, the most important references, okay? So more hardcore engineering. This is the sort of overall uh, view. So this is by Mate Zahari and others called Spark, the definitive guide. And um, this is um, if you want to sort of it's, it's a more a slightly newer edition. Okay. So these things are O'Reilly, so your library should usually have subscription to it. If not, please request that uh, they, they get subscription. So that's where you can sort of chase the details. Okay, there's a lot of industrial sponsors. I won't get into it. You can read about it, but I just want to give some props up to Databricks and AWS and also Combiont RB. So I work at Combiont for um, roughly one day a week. Uh, I'm actually the industrial supervisor of Alvin Hoft here. That's what she's doing. So um, they, they, they've given a lot of support uh, for the course over the time. Yeah, I'm old, nearly 50. I don't know what I'm doing. The only department that tolerates me is the Department of Mathematics all over the world. So I'm, I've been here for about six years. Okay. So what I wanted to mainly talk about today is what is the data science process, right? So this is, uh, uh, what is it? Is it really anything new? Um, and how do we actually see this? Uh, if some of you are like, what's this? Rather sending links to von Neumann's mutual assured destruction and you know whatever, <laughs> regenerative agriculture and blah, blah, blah. Um, there is actually a very simple way to formalize this mathematically, right? Um, I won't go the I won't do the mathematical formulas except to the end. Let's keep this pretty relaxed. So what you have is various domain experts expertise, right? Because we just have too much information. People have to specialize. That's the way of life today. So we have astronomers and bioinformaticians and like I don't know self-experimenting regenerative farmers. It's like a new breed of people. So there's a lot of traffic engineering and so on. And the core thing is raw data is collected. Okay. Uh, don't think about bits or anything, right? Don't even think about computers right now. So information, some, some, somebody is, collect, is collected, it's processed, it's clean. There's some kind of modeling and, and, and inference and decision-making using algorithms that happens. And then you sort of communicate it and then you create a so-called data product. Some, some product you, you sell back into the world, right? So this is, uh, and this, this data product is, is, is very abstract in, in, in that kind of process. It could be an algorithm, a software platform. It could be the services you render by writing on the blackboard after you know, doing research as a, as a math professor, right, whatever. So it, it's just something you do to make a living. Okay? It's just that general. The other important aspects are entrepreneurship is usually involved because it's assumed that this entity, that's the so-called experimenter, it's involved in the process, actually is trying to you know, have an entrepreneurial spirit. Right? So maybe they want to start their own company. And that's one of the main goals of the course is to inspire you to be your own bosses if you want. Of course, core skills are math, stats, computer science, some natural language, you know, Swedish, English, whatever, many languages is helpful. 
But um, that's at a high level the data science process. Okay. So, so what is data science process under the algorithms, machines, people's climate framework? This is nothing but uh, so I let me put some square words. So we have this shift theory. This is a branch of mathematics that's about making a decision before you take an action, right? So what is the, there's, there's an entity, maybe it's half squared and half fourths. It could be non-human. There is some entity, it could be a machine. So the entity is called the experimenter or decision maker. Experimenter or more generally a decision maker. So the decision maker has sense organs, right? Sensors. Yeah, could be machine. So it senses something in its environment, a time t. So t is discrete, right? So and at some point you jump on the timeline and time goes forward. So at xt it senses something. And you can think of that sensing as like, you know, there's some kind of uh, sensing, it has some side information, and uh, this can be thought of as a question, it's trying to answer, you know, uh, and this is some extra side information. And then it has to act, okay? So it senses this, and then it has to act, take an action, right? So let's call this AP. So, and it has to continuously repeat this, okay? The, the, the formalism of this uh, is uh, so-called predicting from individual sequences. There's a link to the book at the bottom, you can pick it out. But the main point I want to make here is that this is trans probability, probability theory. That means it can use probability theory if needed using Kolmogorov's axioms, but it need not be constrained by that. This is the direct link to what, um, I don't know how many of you saw uh, Gus's talk, CAA talk. Did you at least watch the few minutes? Okay, thank you. It takes about seven minutes for me to describe it, right? So based on personal. So he makes a big distinction between enumeration and modeling. You recall this? He makes a big distinction between enumeration and modeling in uh, dealing with big data data science, it's all basically the same thing as art, right? And um, you cannot really deal with enumeration in the strictest sense of tracking whatever he gave an example of uh, some underwear warmer that's coming in a flight, blah, 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 right? This is CAA or whatever. You start from Chinese are doing the same thing and it means Russian, but, but that's an enumeration problem. It's a search problem, right? And modeling is different. Modeling usually uses lots of assumptions. You can be inside the realm of probability theory and statistical probability theory. Uh, then, then this is uh, and he, he makes big distinction. Both these frameworks are actually mathematically uh, passable in this in this setting uh, by Lugosi and others uh, in this book called Learning Probability and Games. So. I guess what I'm trying to say is there's a sort of mathematically clear way to see this. And the most important point is there's not just one entity. If this entity is taking a sequence of actions, right, in its, in its world, right, to go through time, to, to just live, right, make a living, right, those are called life experiments, life experimenters. Okay, you can have a whole collection of life experimenters that are organized under various uh, things, right? In India, it's like various armies uh, of different ethnic groups that all fight against, say, China. But it could be, you know, in modern Europe, it could be people all working together in the academic military industrial complex of modern nation state, right? We are part of the Swedish academic military industrial complex, right? It's, it's one. I mean, this is Eisenhower's speech in telling you. So, so there can be organizations where multiple life experimenters are hierarchically organized to act individually and collectively. And when you see all of that, okay, 
Um, so, you know, um, you have peoples, and of course, we're on planet, so that's the basic framework. These things, using this mathematical framing, can be seen as what's called descriptive game theories. Okay. Uh, I don't want this to be sort of, like you can look this up in Wikipedia. So when you take the string theory in this setting and embed it into, into physics, physics and chemistry and climate and so on, then uh, you can actually formalize all of this uh, using this game theory. So that's what this framework is about. Of course, we have algorithms, but algorithms by themselves without machines cannot be implemented, right? The extracts of the algorithms, you know, the meta information or whatever, cannot be owned by corporate entities, right? Uh, at least in some parts of the world, right? And peoples is very general here, so it's not it's peoples in the sense of the Oglala Lakota Nation, right? This is the only Native American tribe that is still technically at war with the United States. I spent two years there in their Buffalo Ranch, the Oglala Lakota Nation, right? The people is I don't know white people, black people. They call me real Indian, real Indian. But also plant species, animal species, because they are all peoples in their nomenclature. It's highly non-Linnaean, you know, taxonomy, right? So, so we we're actually talking about like microbes and all sorts of living things, right? Because they're all interrelated and continuum, right? The Darwinian synthesis. That's what people mean. Planet, well, we're all stuck here. So that's kind of a you know, that's 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 the pitch, right? That's what we all sort of, that's the data science process. What is scalable data science in computer machine learning? The main main idea here is that I'm not going to teach you how to farm, right? I actually can't because I have to learn myself. But the, the main idea is that these algorithms have to already be a little bit beyond what things were like 12 years ago in computer science curriculum, right? So we need to already think about distributed algorithms or being aware of these machines, these clouds or whatever, right? That are um, that are there, right? So these are clouds. Yeah, so a whole bunch of commodity machines hooked up. And uh, so we need to really uh, be able to process a lot of data and take actions. So this exact framework, when xt is zero, means a cat, one means not a cat, and yt is an image, that's supervised learning, right? So supervised learning is in this framework, for example. Uh, so all the standard things you do are actually um, uh, uh, need to be scalable so that you can digest like 800 billion images of cats and not cats. And somehow puts a gun to your head and says, this is a cat. It's like, okay, I'll do my best. It's kind of like this, right? So that's the that's the main idea. The core infrastructure is in the public cloud, and we also have to learn. So this is actually mostly modeling here. Okay, this is basically search. Um, so this course we don't doing much searching, ex except sorting is the most primitive operation for searching. So you will learn at least technically about sorting, and you will do a lot of sorting. But, but now we are again scalable sorting means sorting like petabytes of integers faster than your adversity. So often what happens in the setting is that one experimental entity is co-experimenting with another experimental entity who is generally considered an adversary. So this is when you move into sort of game theory, right? So it's not only enough to sort fast, but faster than anyone else who you know, you're competing with, right? Okay, I'm not gonna read through all this. Uh, what is data science? You can kind of look at it. Uh, this is the video I, I mean, I, I learned about this video in Snowden's, uh, oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, There's an E that's moved a bit. What happened? It says YouTube.com instead of YouTube.com. Oh, yeah, com. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was like, what the fuck? Sorry. Yeah, okay, let's see if that works. The E should have moved. Oh, right. Just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You talk right. No, <laughs> yeah. Nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's around. I, I really like this video because uh, let's see how much time we have. It's just that old. Uh, you start. Whenever you want. It can be 3, 3.15. Wow. 
just yes, yes. Log, I'll try and fix the link later. So here is actually, um, you know, so these are some books. So I mentioned the predicting learning and games and uh, probabilistic theory of pattern recognition is sort of more classical learning theory. Right? So if you want to really get to the bottom of this, I'm teaching a course on theoretical foundation of data science next term, but uh, you already have too many courses, so it's not necessary. You can read on your own. Data engineering and data science, I just want to say a few words. Uh, these divisions are largely becoming meaningless in, in, in sort of real edge cases, but of course people have limited training. So engineers do a set of operations and data scientists usually come from like physics and math and they do a set of things. But people who get promoted faster actually can kind of do what needs to be done. So this data engineering scientist, the middle way. And uh, a brief tour of data science, a bit of history. So one thing I want you to realize that this should be apparent that this is nothing new, right? I mean, we can do this even if we didn't have humans. Like, Frogs are catching flies and going through time. I mean, they have sensors and they're learning and so on. So it, it, it's a very general thing. The only difference is we are basically too much information. Okay, so this is about the cloud and so on. What should you be able to do at the end of the course? Uh, understand the principles of fault tolerant scalable computing in Spark. So that means as machines fail, as individual machines in this network fail, your algorithms should still be guaranteed to finish. As long as number theoretically, the ceiling of one third of n machines don't fail simultaneously, we can guarantee. You know, that, uh, yeah, so, you, so you can always nuke, nuke a data center and then game over, but as long as only one third of the machines fail at any given time, we can actually implement the mo most primitive number theory protocol on which all this weird algorithms work, right? So these are things you can learn at KBH much better, the distributed computing group. Um, so here is a bunch of links, so I won't uh, go too much into it. Uh, I wanted to point out at least this anatomy of AI article. So this was the sort of discussion I wanted to have. Um, right, so have you read, uh, have you browsed through the anatomy of AI? Let me see if my, if my link is... Yeah, I know what happened with my CAA video because I it was UQ.B or D or something, and I tried to fix the URL, you know, my own head. So, so how many of you know about Alexa? Okay, right. Yeah, so it starts with like Alexa, turn on the lights, right? That's an action you're taking. You bought some product, right? Bezos sold you, and it's very convenient, right? And you're acting, and it, it you know it helps you make life easier in some sense. But uh, the point about this course and the data science process in this algorithms, machines, people's climate framework is to actually trace as much as you can what's all behind you know uh, the processes that enable you to act. Understand when you say Alexa turn on the lights. Well, what is Alexa? Well, it's a physical device. Where did each atom come from? What are the algorithms in it? Like what went on into this, right? So being fully aware of it is essentially the main point of this lecture, right? And this is super concrete. Um, I mean, I can't force you to read this. It's just for your own uh, knowledge. But basically, it's an anatomical map of human labor data and planetary resources. It has some, some Marxist undertones, but it doesn't matter. There's still facts. I'm not a Marxist or anything. Uh, Marx had some ideas. We're good. Right? Um, so anyway, this is um, basically about uh, what's happening, lithium, their supply chain. It's, there's a poverty, hunger, war, child soldiers, and stuff, right? So uh, I think, yeah. I mean, how many of you were, are aware of like what's in our modern, including my iPhone? And there's a Kate Crawford gave a good talk on this. It's on YouTube. Um, oh, nice. at some Australian university. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. So you got like nine thousand views. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah, Kate Crawford's talk would be a really good uh, thing to see, but um, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, this one? It's like some Australian university. Yeah, that's she's one. at Microsoft Research, this one. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, you need New South Wales. Center for Ideas, that sounds ominous. My name's Ian Jacobs, and I have the. Oh, he's an hour long. Yeah. <laughs> So I've been living in New York for the last 10 years and one of my favourite rituals of coming home to Sydney is the flight in when the planes are okay. so anyway <laughs> it's uh I don't I don't want to you know spend too much time on this but uh what I think is is fairly obvious by just even you know skimming through this uh is that there is quite a lot of transfer of, of, of matter and, and energy of you know people lose and so on uh, when when we're doing these things right so uh my first question is were you actually i mean how aware were you like about these kinds of things I mean, Corona, we all really were shocked, right? With supply chain crisis, I can't get a battery for my laptop, you know, and I have to buy a new laptop. And so we, we, we didn't experience that things are interconnected, right? The, the Corona shocks. But, um, I mean, but the scale of it is actually quite mind boggling. That's what I found in this article. Um, yeah, anyway, she talks about Serpens Serpensky's uh, gaskets. So, uh, Marxist theories. And so this becomes a complex structure of supply chains within supply chains, a zooming fractal of tens of thousands of suppliers, millions of kilometers of shipped material, and hundreds of thousands of workers included within the process, even before the product is assembled on the line. Right? And uh, yeah. So any thoughts? Yeah. Um, let's go back to one is um... I also found that the infrastructure is probably one of the most interesting things about that, about like how much of the infrastructure of the internet is rooted in the physical world and how much of that is political. So like, that's the thing to learn And then the other thing, which um, I can't remember if it was in this talk or another one, but it was capable for us on that space. So the, the only reason that Amazon don't give away Alexa for free is because people would be suspicious. Because uh, <laughs> they make so much money to get from that. Well, it's also mind boggling, right? Amazon, like the number of Indians and nowadays Vietnamese being used to train these so called yeah. artificially intelligent systems, right? I mean, but imagine like when dialects evolve and so on, like this is, I mean, you can only do so much of transfer learning, right? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a non trivial problem. And, and um, I don't know, a lot of the NLP. Guys in in India, including Nvidia, are having so much trouble because people switch between dialects and, and languages, like as they talk. Right, it's so difficult to actually get certain Indian cosmopolitan city slangs because they evolve fast as well. I'm just saying, you know, you can't have an Amazon Turk, Turk, Turk army keep doing this, right? But it's uh, a lot of it is, uh, you know. Yeah, a lot of it needs to be somewhat uh, seen in a, in, you know, with a grain of salt at the same time. I do research in AI myself, but I'm also going to be giving you some, some, some caution. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I just put this out because this is some of the sort of life, side, life science side of things, and it's clearly really outside the scope here. But there are other kinds of um, you know intellectual property wars being waged on on journal assets. Like right? this is mostly in the U.S. The EU has very good laws against sort of owning by journalism. But uh, the other thing to briefly point out is the joint operating environment. Um, so all of this, right? Okay, all these entities that are trying to go through time, make a living. 
whole shebang, geopolitics, everything, right? Okay, that's happening. But it's not happening in an in, in a, in a arbitrarily infinite uh, resource base or operational base, right? So in the English-speaking world, the joint operating environment is maybe the, 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 the simplest way to understand this. Because as I said, uh, a lot of the human entities are organized into nation states. And um, so this is basically a public document from the US uh, Joint Forces Command. So they're kind of the core brain of NATO. Sweden is joining NATO now. Or, um, yeah, almost. So the joint operating environment is intended to inform joint concept development and experimentation through the Department of Defense. It provides a perspective of future trends, shocks, contexts and implications for future joint force commanders and other leaders and professionals in the national security field. So this document is speculative in nature and does not supposed to predict. In fact, if you follow the links and you're interested in board, you can see what they themselves have been correcting. So all these PDFs are confiscated at the timestamps. So rather it is intended to serve as a starting point for discussion about the future security environment at the operational level of the war. Right. This is just happening, right? So we have this sort of joint operating environment that if pushed beyond a certain point, you know, we have designed the world to lead to mutual acute destruction. So of course, it's in this framework that uh, we are basically doing these sorts of experiments, right? So, so this is, uh, you should know this, uh, in fact, von Neumann is credited, a mathematician for uh, coming up with this concept. So you shouldn't be, I uh, wouldn't be scared by this. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a fact of life. So that's, that's the balance on which, where all of the collective actions we are generally trying to avoid going, right? Okay. So finally, okay, some positive note. There is, I mean, if you, you know, I, I don't know, I found out about them from some, some one of my professors, is uh, advisor of World Bank. He told me about this. That's how I know these guys from Trace. So this is, uh, there are some people are trying to do something about it also. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, we should do this, but there is some kind of visions and strategies, and there is also, you know, other kinds of processes in place. So energy transition, nature conservation, conservancy, and regenerative agriculture. And with that, I'm going to sort of turn over the floor to to people from trees in two minutes. They uh, they actually they'll tell you more about it, but they actually work on supply chains, like where your food comes from, where this particular bean of soy comes from, and so on, so that you can actually you know at least your actions that you take to eat, to ingest, to live could potentially be, you know, sort of, uh, there's some kind of trace that maybe you want to be aware of, for example. So um, that's it from me. Are there any questions? So is this okay if I put this in, uh, in, the, in the archive and video later on? We can like stop video and have more free discussions, especially you know if you want to bar hop after class, before dinner and after dinner. Yeah, so we, we don't have to record everything, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know. That's what we did at Cornell when I was grad student for faculty, right? So okay, good. Um, 